So the interesting motion that we have for this afternoon is this. If you've got a pencil or a pen with you, take note, okay? The, chain, uh, the notion that we're going to talk about and debate over would be, this house believes that Singapore should introduce a correct English order. Can you remember this corrective work order? You litter, you just go downstairs, you sweep the floor in the fluorescent netted jacket. But this time around, it's contextualized to this. This house believes that Singapore should introduce a correct English order. And as a GP teacher who just marked a whole stack of GP essays, I say yes. I say yes. But it's not me to do the debating today, but it's actually our four speakers. And before I introduce them, just to give you a sense of the, pro uh, the process of this afternoon's debate uh, sequence, each speaker from both uh, proposition and opposition will have four minutes, minutes to speak. At the third minute, you will hear this effect. There you go. That's the indication for the third minute. At, when the time is up at the fourth minute, you will hear a double chime. All right. And after which, we will continue with the second speaker for both sides and then with a audience participation round. So be careful as you listen, form your opinions. The mic may just come up. I'm going to introduce some of us and invite some of us to share your thoughts on the motion. And after which, both side speakers will have a chance. Any opposition spe uh, proposition speaker will speak for another two minutes to round out the position and likewise for the opposing side. And the most exciting thing is, who decides the winner? It is democracy at work. All of us will get to vote. Which side do we uh, feel has the most convincing argument and persuasion this afternoon? And now, the four excited and, excite, uh, and much energized speaker, they've been thinking and sleeping on the notion for, I think, the whole weekend. And I'm going to introduce them to you now. Now, the, for the proposition, the first speaker is my literary idol when I was a teenager because he wrote the two, of, two books that I read even as an adult, I still read as an adult, none other than our very own local Sioux Town, Mr. Adrian Tan. <laughs> Second speaker for proposition, as a GP teacher, he is in some sense my proverbial boss from the Ministry of Education, the Assistant Director, English Language and Literature, Mr. Simon, Charles Reynolds. And the first speaker for the opposition would be uh, the much respected and uh, Singapore's own and much respected literary critic, poet, and graphic artist, Mr. Gui Li Sui. And you have already heard the man's work. If you use this blog as much as I do as my GP lessons for commentary and uh, opinions, this is the second speaker for our opposition team, um, the, the prolific blogger himself, Mr. Miyagi, Mr. Benjamin Lee. All right. On the notion, this house believes that Singapore should introduce a correct English order. May I invite the first speaker, Mr. Adrian Tan, to share with us his thoughts. <clears throat> Comrades, <laughs> Chairman Go, our dear leader, <laughs> we are facing a crisis today, a national crisis. We in the Speak Good English movement know that good English has many benefits. Good English keeps you slim, improves your complexion, reduces your cholesterol, and lengthens your life. But most importantly, good English is good for your soul. Since the dawn of time, human beings have striven towards one goal, to be understood. Good English helps people understand you, and you will thereby become a more fulfilled person. But we in Singapore do not just care about the individuals. We care about something else, our nation. Good English is good. For our country, Singapore is a unique country. We became successful because we are orphans. We are Chinese, Indian, Malay, and others. We are yellow, <laughs> brown, beige, ecru, tan, mauve, and alabaster. Sorry, Simon. <laughs> but we all have one thing in common. Our mother tongue is English. That is our real resource, ladies and gentlemen. That is what made Singapore great. We are traders to the world because the world understands us. That is our advantage over our neighbours and our competitors. After all, the standard of English in China, Taiwan, Thailand, Indonesia is poor, and in Australia, it's non-existent. 
So Singapore has become the great interfacer. We thrive because we are a bridge between the English-speaking world and Australia and Asia. <laughs> Recently, though, Singapore has begun to face many changes. Singaporeans are discontented. Many people have suggested theories. Homes are more expensive, transport system is strained, our weather is hazy, our people are not reproducing enough. The real reason for discontent, though, is that we feel misunderstood. And when we are not understood, we are frustrated, we are underappreciated, we cannot express ourselves precisely. That accounts for the proliferation of very angry blogging and angry citizenry. We cannot nuance. We have only two extremes of emotion, happy or sad. So you get blogs with very limited vocabulary, complaints that have very limited range, because we can't speak good English. We have lost that ability. We cannot make people understand us anymore, and we feel frustrated. So how do we fix this? How do we persuade Singaporeans to do something which we know is important? Well, in the past, we have tried to persuade Singaporeans to keep Singapore clean and green, or to do national service, or to reproduce. But ladies and gentlemen, we in Singapore know what works. If we want Singaporeans to join the army and give up their lives for two years, do you think we will go around saying to them, oh, it's good for you. It's good for you to do national service. If you do that, we will give you tax breaks. Haha, <laughs> no, we know in Singapore that only one thing works. If we want to make Singaporeans do something, we must threaten them. <laughs> yes, ladies and gentlemen, if we want our country to be clean and green, we do not have to educate our people, we threaten them. If we want people to stop smuggling drugs, do we go up to them and say, drugs are bad for you? Please think twice before you introduce foreign substances into your bloodstream. No, we punish them, we cane them. And when it comes to littering, we publicly shame and humiliate them. And that is what I'm advocating today. <laughs> I think the only way to improve the standards of English in Singapore is to grab all those people with bad grammar and publicly humiliate and embarrass them. I believe that is good for the country and that is the only way forward. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Tan. It's almost scary to be convinced by him. But to present the opposing perspective, I'm going to invite the first speaker from the opposing team, Mr. Gui. Mr. Gui, please. Thank you. Dear chairman and publisher of many Singlish books, <laughs> corporate opponents, ladies and gentlemen, what can be worse than a correct English order? I have five points. One, no doubt this smart alecky idea comes from our punishment from littering, but even with that, we haven't been very successful, have we? Or Tim Palin wouldn't be finding soiled sanitary pads in a ward, or Bayam Kim won't be taking pictures with soiled diapers in his ward. Just recently, someone threw his HDB from his HDB flat, bricks, an air cooler, dumbbells. Why do these things still happen? Because punishment is not foolproof. It never is. Even God, who created hell, couldn't stop people from going there to meet their lawyers. <laughs> so, more punishment? Really? How imaginative is that? Two, we Singaporeans are already being punished every day, from the cradle to the grave. At school, we were, publi pub we were punished with remedials if we don't do well, and with higher expectations if we do well. For the men, we are punished with NS, and during NS itself, we are also punished. It's called punishception. For the, for, the woman, we, for the women, you are punished with sexism all your life through. At work, we are punished with more work or new work. We don't actually earn more, so we look forward to retirement, and that keeps getting pushed back. If we don't say anything, we suffer. If we speak up, we are called names, armchair critics, noisy, lazy, full of self-entitlement. Three, yet this proposition, these people, huh? We'll try to convince you that Singaporeans can only learn from punishment. We need to have the spurs kick into our hide. These people will think up ways, many ways of torturing us. The more perverse, the more effective. But that's not learning. When I call you ugly and you punch my face, that won't make you any more good looking. 
If I speak bad English and you slap me with penalties, discipline, extra classes, I do obey because these are things I have to do so that I can go on and do something else. I will speak my own English elsewhere at my own time to my own friends. Four, indeed, what can be worse than punishment? Do you know why it won't work? Because language is a part of people. It is part of our being. You can't change people, you can, you can't change people from how they feel um, they can be best, no, sorry. You can't change people from how they feel they can be best expressed. You need to convince them that a correct grasp of English is rewarding. It can help them see or think about themselves better. People change only when they want to change, not from punishment. If you police too strongly, people cannot own a, own, a, own a language. And when they cannot, they will speak something else. They will speak more of only Singlish, Chinese, Malay, Tamil. And you will ironically get your perfect English environment because everybody is speaking something else, just not English. Fact is, five, you know what can be worse than a correct English order? All of us will ultimately be slapped with it. Have you heard our English teachers? Have you read our newspapers or watched our TV? Have you listened to our cabinet minister and um, secretary general of NTUC? <laughs> I speak Singlish or improper English too, and I love to speak it to you today to illustrate how warm and affecting it can be. But the organizers have threatened to drag me out if I do. Um, so, <laughs> really, you know. Who speaks correct English all the time anyway? You know only one person does, and I'm not looking at the proposition. Uh, definitely not you, Simon Reynolds. Uh, <laughs> e even you cannot be right all the time. Only one person, and it is the founder of Singapore since the 11th century, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. Praise be. Your, our nation. Have you ever heard him speak Singlish or improper English? No, right? Never. He always conjugates correctly, uses the right words. His subject verb agreement is always right. When Lee Kuan Yew, praise be our nation, was interviewed by <laughs> Charlie Rose, Charlie Rose becomes Singlish. <laughs> so everyone from our Kopitiam pioneer generation to our teachers, journalists, civil servants, and politicians will not be spared. Only one Singaporean will be spared, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. Praise be our nation. <laughs> and look, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, praise be our nation, be, has no time for this. He can't be administrating correct English order and disciplining every time, which he has sometimes, but uh, all the time, right? By the way, if you have a speak proper English movement, it's called spam. Huh? <laughs> if, you, if, you call, uh, if, you, if you call speak correct English movement, it's scam. Huh? So please stop punishing Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, praise be our nation. Because he has already done so incredibly much for this country. That goes for the rest of us, who in our small ways are already doing our damnest best for this place. Stop wasting our time. Thank you. Hey, thank you. All right. That's a very firm comeback. And going to catch the ball would be my boss, Mr. Simon Reynolds, Yay. to round it up for the proposition. Well, thank you. But I, again, I think you quite clearly missed the point. You say that all this punishment and punitive measures don't work, but of course they do. It's the Singapore culture. It's not something we should shy. We should embrace it. Of course, the other aspect of Singapore culture is we do love to complain. And that's something you're doing. You complain as much as you want, but you still want the punitive measures. You still want it. We complain, okay, the Americans, when they're fed up, buy guns. The British just protest. They have protest marches or protest dinners or protest parties. In Singapore, we complain, but we still get on. We still want the punitive measures. I mean, you say that corrective work orders don't work. Does anybody really believe that? Can you imagine the state of HDB estates if we didn't have them? Similarly, we need correct English orders to align things, to put things right. Let me give you another example. Uh, if you look at the MRT, would we line up at the MRT a recent innovation if we didn't have the line markings for queues and those fearsome ladies with their little red fluorescent shaped sticks shepherding us along. Of course we wouldn't. It works. It works. And the line, Q line markings for language is correct grammar. 
and we need corrective English orders as the little ladies with their red fluorescent sticks to guide us and to make sure we stay within those markings. Otherwise, it won't happen. Let's take another example of our DJs. Look at the way DJs speak. If their excesses weren't controlled by fining them and banning them from time to time, we all remember uh, Sheikh Heichel's terrible. I mean, remember that from a few years ago? It still makes me turn white, even whiter. <laughs> and I, I pant with indignation and outrage at what he said then. But he was stopped because he was fine. Look at Joyce Augustine's recent uh, bullish uh, verbal departure from the norm. He was fined. And if we don't do that, they, what would they do? And we need to issue these DJs, if we issue with them correct English orders, we'd see an improvement in their grammar. Take smoking. We all know that smoking causes many serious diseases. We also know that if you look at the package of a cigarette, the, the gruesome photos they have, does it work? No, what does work is slowly banning it from everywhere, in public spaces, in queues and everywhere. That works. That is the Singapore way. And we really, really need to take action. If we look at what poor grammar does for Singapore, not only does it kill communication, more importantly, it causes a loss of face. For heaven's sake, I have had a Taiwanese citizen come up to me and be dismissive of Singaporeans' use of grammar. I mean, how more humiliating can you get than that? If we really need to correct this. Look at some of the examples we have. I, I'm, I'm just quoting here. There was one uh, example. It said, uh, crispy crap. Crackers. Crap. C-R-A-P. Do we want this sort of thing going on food items? The only thing useful of that is I can think that it's a good culinary metaphor for the opposition's arguments. <laughs> Another one was instead of no dumping, it said no dumplings. <laughs> Do you know that this caused a dim sum lover to have a heart attack? <laughs> so we obviously cannot continue.